my brother is five years older than me. Okay. So uh, when I was eight, nine, 10, he was 13, right? So he was listening to things that I wouldn't otherwise have been exposed to. And uh, whatever they might have been, the, the Beatles, probably the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, you know, that sort of era. Yeah. And on holiday, my parents bought me a little acoustic guitar you know, for five pounds or whatever. Yeah. And that, so that was the start of both quite young. He joined a band at um, the age of, or, you know, he played in bands, cousins or what, friends or whatever, which, and finally going professional at from an early age, like 15. He was a drummer. So <laughs> I learned how to drum by default. And uh, my cousin and I used to play rubbish as you do yeah. and then at around the age of 16 or 17 i think i formed a bedroom band um i managed by devious means to get a revox recorder and a microphone and a friend had a drum box i think and so we pooled our resources and we used to do these this songwriting in a bedroom on headphones with a drum box bouncing from one track to the other. And uh, anyway, we did that for years, ending up being offered a deal with EMI, which didn't come to fruition because we were stupid and it wasn't good enough, which of course, in retrospect, it was more than good enough, but we thought we were the business. And in the meantime, yeah. my guitar player got better and better. And I started doing jingles for a friend who had a jingles company unbelievably oh, and wow, okay. um so <laughs> uh at about the age of 21 around then i was i did a session for him and he i i said to him you know what if i understood how all this gear worked i could make my guitar sound really good and he said well, it's funny you should say that because I've just bought a building and I want to build a studio in the basement. Would you be interested in going 50-50 on the studio? You build yeah. it and run it and I'll finance it. And obviously I said yes. And he said, you've got 15 grand and a year. And it was 1,200 square feet of basement. So with a low, lowish ceiling. So 50, 15 grand one year, no knowledge whatsoever about anything. Wow. And um, he just left me to my own devices. Of course, I had to live off that money because it was a full-time occupation trying to figure what I was doing. Anyway, yeah. come the, it, there was an absolute date. He, he literally said a year. And at the end of the year, uh, we're doing a session. And true to his word, it was a... a jingle for a, a hovercraft you know going over the channel called sea oh, wow. speed and it was a yeah. band who came in on our first day of opening i had never engineered i'd never assisted my knowledge was garnered from that year of acquiring the gear and building the studio which you can imagine for actually far less than 15 grand because i had to live so mm. whatever it was that's what it was and we had a session and i had to do the session and i bought a second a very old tape machine that had a system where when you hit play or record these two pinch wheels went in but they weren't in alignment and i knew nothing about this and every time they went in the tape yeah. did this and half the time it rode over the top and ripped the tape and the other half it just settled down to that my first very first session with anyone was like a five piece band got some kind of noise ran over to the tape machine put it in record had to wait 15 seconds to see whether it settled down or not ran over said okay play they played and that's trial by fire that's how i started wow. absolutely yeah. amazing so it's so unbelievable, though, the fact that, as you said, you only had a year to to do that in. So what, what was going through your mind at that time? Were you nervous to try and get everything done within that year period? Or were you? did you feel quite settled after a period of time? Uh, 
I, I can't really answer that because my whole my life has consisted of those moments. Okay. Really. Uh, in fact, um, thinking about it, when I, the first movie I was asked to do was uh, The Dark Knight Rises. Yep. Never worked on a movie. And um, I, my response when it was offered to me was, uh, I think I said, I'm confident in my ignorance. Wow. And that is, I, I don't know how else to be. What are you going to do? You, you know, you're presented with an opportunity, just dive in and figure it. It's really interesting that you're saying that. So looking at, you know, obviously I, I know that over the decades you've worked with so many amazing artists. And then all of a sudden, I've noticed looking at your discography, all of a sudden you veer into film. And so was was The Dark Knight Rises, was that the first, so as you said, that, that was the first film yeah. that, that you tackled. Yeah. But then I noticed that projects, you, you did a lot of other projects after that. Uh, in many, many films. So did you start to feel comfortable with film scores and been um, mixing? I, you know, the first, that movie showed yeah. me that the, the not to say I don't like records, making records, don't get me wrong, I love it. But sure. there's a thing that happened to me at that point. I started getting really bored with the predictability, you know, with the verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse two, pre-chorus, yeah, chorus, bridge, you know, the same instrumentation, the whole thing, the whole process was just beginning to grind a bit. Mm. And the thing about movies is it's kind of the exact opposite. You have no idea where the music's going to go for the most part because it's dictated by the picture. Sure. And the instrumentation is always extraordinary. Mm. So that is incredibly appealing to me. Coupled with the fact that I'm still making records and going between the two works really well. Because at the end of a long project of film music, by the end, it's kind of, you've done a lot of work on, on this sort of stuff. I think the film I enjoyed to date the most uh, through for a combination of reasons was Rush. It was the second movie I did. And um, I had a, basically Hans gave me free reign. And it was very exciting, that sort of ignorance of not really knowing what I was doing, but having great people around to help. And and I thought the result, the finished score, I thought was amazing. Not not because of me, you know, just right. because of everyone involved. It was I thought it was a really, really strong piece of work and very appropriate for the movie. Fantastic. So that I would say is my my favorite, but they're all enjoyable in different ways. So in a, in a way, picking one is weird. Um, anyway, that's Hans, but there are two other composers I've worked with. Lorne Balfe, do you know anything about Lorne? Yeah. Mega. And I've done loads of, of work with him and it's always extraordinary. He is extraordinary. His sort of ability to cover ground to work his work ethic the speed at which he works and the quality of what he does is mind-blowing and another guy who's spanish who i got thrust upon and we've worked together uh loads subsequently called roque banos he's okay. spanish and uh he the reason i ended up working with him lorm I work with because of hands. He's part of the remote control sure. sort of family. Uh, but Roque uh, was doing a score for Ron Howard, who I knew because I'd done one or two movies with him. And they weren't, I, I don't quite know why I was asked to work on it. I think because he'd done a very classical score and they wanted a hybrid score. And so they brought me in to do the hybrid bit. Which at first Roque absolutely hated, you know, his beautiful, he's amazing. So his orchestral score existed. And then I appeared and sort of shoved in loads of beats and synths and whatever, not loads, yeah. but, you know, yeah, giving sure. it a slightly different slant. And to begin with, he hated it and ended up quite happy. And that, well, he must have been because we've worked on loads of movies since. Um, 
so anyway that's they're the composers i work with fantastic T tell us the story behind lion king as well how did that project come about and how did you what what i understand that you you're working with Hans oh, yeah, on lion that. king oh. yeah and for, for our williams that. as well yeah oh pharrell i worked um worked on spider-man with pharrell so i knew him quite well and when it came to um lion king hang on i've just got to make a note of something there uh yeah. he he um I, I'm not quite sure what happened, but I ended up finishing off his songs. I don't know. I was confused. I got loads of information from different sources and had to put the songs together. And whatever, he'd done some, some from the original movie. So I just kept getting stuff sent to me and I had to make sense of everything that was sent and produce the songs basically for the lion king Amazing. which was very difficult a and successful i don't know it was kind of successful because the film did really well yeah but i do believe the critics preferred the original versions of the songs but you know what they were going to whatever we'd have done they were going to prefer the originals yeah absolutely. You know, it's like it, it, something you're used to then anyway yeah makes sense i understand there's a um a story if i'm right in saying this about th those various drummers that were involved with the project and there was one particular drummer that you that you liked oh yeah i so can't I remember who about it that. was uh that would have been just can't wait to be king yeah and uh what happened what happened i think there was a percussion session i can't remember which studio it was at but these studios the film studios have huge recording rooms and this particular day i think there were eight drummers in the room all yeah. really well-known drummers you're going to ask me who and i can't really remember but That's i knew okay. them knew them all they're all sure. big famous drummers yeah and there was a, there's a section in just can't wait to be king which has it's like a eight bar drum solo kind of and uh the idea we we toyed with various ideas so one idea was eight eight drummers eight bars take a bar each and then i thought that's stupid that's just going to sound like garbage so <laughs> let's try everyone rubbish yeah. okay why don't we get each person to do let's loop it right the eight bars and yep. just get everyone to do the eight bars I think that's what happened, whatever. It doesn't really matter. It was one guy who stood out. And I realized it must have been the most expensive uh, drum audition the world has ever known. You know, wow. getting eight <laughs> top line drummers in sure. and picking one for a solo. But he was great, this guy. I wish I could remember his name. But then, anyway, so I just picked one and was too embarrassed to say, you know, to hit the talk back and go, you. <laughs> so i got someone else to do it i suppose how, how uh, yeah how, how could you uh tell all the other drummers that they weren't good enough for the project it would have been a very awkward what, conversation it? yeah <laughs> everyone playing those eight bars one step forward not so fast you lot you know <laughs> yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't know how to do it but you know it happened and it's yeah. fine and and he was amazing it was uh, to do with the swing the kind of swing i wanted it um my reference to him, which for some reason made him laugh, was uh, what's the drummer's name in the Muppets? Oh, Animal. Yeah, that was my reference. And someone said, "Oh, you mean Gene Krupa?" And I said, "No, no, no, I mean Animal, because <laughs> Animal must have been based on Gene Krupa, right?" Yeah. I'm pretty sure that would have been his his sort of direction. But then Animal went further. And and that's what appealed to me. It was just loony, and that's what the guy did. He did it really well, but it was, it felt very strange in that setting, you know. With the, it's, these these sessions are big time sessions, you know, with loads of people in the studio there, and all the engineers and this, that, and the other. Loads of people, loads of money, the whole thing. And I'm going, you got to play like Animal from the Muppets. It was just ever so slightly incongruous, but whatever, it worked. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, whatever works, though. Um, so tell us about the project you've worked on fairly recently with Billy Eilish and Phineas with uh, the James Bond theme, No Time to Die. That, um, I'm not sure of the order of events there, but I think it started that project. Hans called me and said, um, Would you produce the Bond song? I didn't know what it was. I think it was that, or oh, it might have been, do you want to work on the score? I, I can't remember which, it doesn't matter. But I went in and um, he said, we've got, there's several con contenders, but I like this one. He played me the song that Billy and Phineas had done. Sure. And um, I instantly said, this is a no brainer. You know, uh, it wasn't that I loved the song immediately, which I did. But it wasn't about that because it's a very unbond. When you first hear it, without the, not the finished version, but the demo, it didn't sound like a big bombastic bond. You know, it didn't sound like what you'd expect, basically. Sure. And um, but but I said to him, "This is a no-brainer. It has has to be this." And um, then I met up with Hans, obviously, and Barbara Broccoli, yeah. who runs the show and um ex my viewpoint was that billy eilish was the no-brainer part you, you know the song is lovely it's really good there are loads of good songs what's so great is billy eilish because her it's it's introducing a whole bunch of people to bond who otherwise wouldn't even know what bond was you're right yeah absolutely but anyway but to get from that point to delivering it was a long, arduous journey for all sorts of reasons, which, which us, that's, they're kind of inappropriate to talk about, but it was hard, very hard work. But it yeah. got there in the end. You know, it had to, there were a lot of people that had to be happy with it. I understand that Daniel Craig was one of the people that Bond himself, he needed to be happy with. Oh, only completely. It was his swan song. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I understand that. Final... Go on. Understand that you had to. Uh, he, he came into the studio with you. That you you cranked up the the volume a little bit more to play him the final the final yeah. take. Is that well, right? Well, it there was a. It was amazing actually that um, everyone was happy. After all we'd gone through, which was, I I can't begin to tell you a huge amount to get to this point. Yeah, we had to sell it to daniel and barbara texted or emailed and said uh daniel's coming to london uh the weekend can we play it to him and she she wanted to play it to him in hans's room which is in soho because i think he was staying there or whatever and and i i suggested to her uh, we play it to him in my studio because it, which is in Wilsdon, not quite Soho. Um, no. uh, I said, it, it'll sound great there. I, I'm telling you, if we want Daniel to like it, let's give it its best shot. And so she spoke to him and they came, she came back to me and said, the only time he can do it, he flies in from wherever, I think New York, and he can get to the studio by 8 a.m. on Sunday in the morning. Wow. I went, okay, that's good. I will have it ready by 8 a.m. on Sunday. So I went in at 6 in the morning, you know, made sure everything was perfect. The room was tidy, you know, everything's working. And uh, put the, not the, I put the multi-track, the Pro Tools file up. Sure. And I'm listening to it and thinking the, I'm thinking the reason he doesn't like it is because it doesn't have a, a bond climax. So I need to give it a bond climax. And I realize there's a point in the song, I don't know if you know it, where Billy goes up instead of down. Instead of going down yeah. to the one, she goes up to the five and holds the note. And I thought, there, right there, what I'm going to do is crank it 8 dB. Now, 8 dB is a huge amount. It's like you know, 3 dB is a lot. 8 dB is insane. Yeah. I thought, I'm going to really do this. I'm going to go mad. So I fixed the mix so you didn't hear it jump 
you know, things just graduated up to the downbeat of, of that bar where she hits a note and uh, found the volume for the song, listened through. And when it hit this moment, it was like, like the earth was caving in. You know, the, speak, the speakers in my room are extraordinary. They're called Dynaudio M4s. Yep. Right. So they got four 12 inch speakers on each side, loud and clear and beautiful with perfect low end which you rarely hear, but this is really good, especially in the hot seat. So yeah. anyway, eight o'clock, uh, Daniel and Barbara arrive and they come up to my room. And, you, you know, it was just weird. Those two people in Wilsdon, you know, walking up to this room, which I've got to be honest, it's not like, like um, you know, walking into some magnificent, studio it's a shambles at best but at any rate it sounds great and sure. there's loads of room in there to sit so she, i sit daniel you know in the seat in the middle and barbara's behind him and i'm in diagonal to them so yeah. i can reach the on you know the play button and uh, so barbara says uh, do you do you want to um, say anything before you play it to daniel this is after all the niceties. How was the flight? All that nonsense. And um, so she said, do you want to say anything before, before you play it? And I went, nope, hit play. Instantly hit play. And it started. And Daniel's sitting, you know, he's sort of looking down, whatever, gets to the end. And the end is, it was shocking how loud it gets. It's like a thunderstorm. <laughs> Uh, finishes and he doesn't look up at all and Barbara is behind him you know what's happening and he goes he said can you play it again hit play goes through again and it finishes and he looks up and Barbara still has no idea whether we're you know looking for another song or what and he goes I love it oh went, brilliant yes Okay, okay, we're home. And so yeah. that was that. And within half an hour, some mad time frame, like half an hour, it was out that Billy Eilish had done the song and it was the theme tune. It like the machinery went into action immediately. It was remarkable. And it always amazes me. There's a thing about doing music. So I'm up here in a room that's, I don't know how big it is. It, it's a bedroom, basically. Yeah. At, at Large-ish, at the top of a house in West Hampstead with a shitload of gear in it. But nonetheless, it's a bedroom. And this is where I've been working. Uh, how long for? For a while, because of lockdown. Because, anyway, for whatever reason, I have my main studio, which I go to every now and then, but here, I'm comfortable. And so I'm, do, I'm working on this stuff in this room and all of a sudden it goes global. And I always find that connection really weird. I can never get used to it, you know, like wow. working on a record and you work in your own little environment and then suddenly it goes global. And that record, that thing you've done in this little place is everywhere. I just always find it amazing. The translation. I remember when we were doing Rush, watching, um, they were editing it in, in uh, the booth of the studio I was working in, in LA. So I had okay. a room and it had two booths. And one had Dan, Ron Howard's editor, editing the movie. So he was like 15 feet away from me. And it was, it just felt so extraordinary that these things that go on, you know, massive screens my yeah. arms are off camera aren't they but you get you get my drift yeah I do, yeah done in little rooms just done and i know they go on to dub stages and what have you but i still find it amazing that that um sort of magnifying effect always gets me yeah it's and incredible. vice versa actually vice versa which is how amazing it is that uh i, I suppose Suppose my best example of it would be um, either Annie or Simple Minds, where 
probably simple minds because they they I went on tour with them for a long time and they play these massive stadium gigs and then backstage in a little room you know so the converse is is true as well from from like owning the world to just having a cup of tea you know the contrast gets me every time what's the difference between standard mixing versus score mixing what how how, how, do, how do the two things how are they separate stand st you, you mean mixing a song or mixing, mixing score? a song yeah mix mixing a song oh, versus mixing okay. a score no comparison they're they're like I learned this to my much to my detriment with uh, Dark Knight Rises. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. When, when mixing to mixing for movies, I assume TV is the same. I haven't had the privilege of working for TV yet, but but uh, working for movies, the lead singer is the dialogue. So, yeah. whatever you're doing, can't overtake that. And my thing when I started on this was listening to the music, understanding what the composer was trying to do, figuring what the story of the music was. I, I yeah. call it a story. It might be a top line, whatever you want to call it. You know, the main melody, which they would do on loads of instruments, and it might switch from one thing to another, and uh, figuring that. And then, and then, of course, to begin with, I got it far too loud, far too bright, and all the mixes were rejected. So everything that I knew was wrong. I had to get the story across, but in such a way it didn't interfere with the dialogue. And I didn't take that in, into consideration. Only, I have to say, only took me one movie to figure it. But, right. uh, and figure it, I did. But that that's the key, making sure that um, you don't interfere with the, the lead vocal. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So going into, so you mentioned Simple Minds and Annie Lennox, so the artists that you've worked with over the years. Um, so talking, for example, about uh, Annie Lennox, No More I Love You. So how did that song come about? Um, how, how did the, the albums come about with Annie Lennox? And yeah, talk, talk to us more about the, the projects that you've worked with with her. Uh, okay. Okay. So with her, I did... What did I do? Three albums, a live album, live DVD, and a whole bunch of singles. I think yeah. that's so. It was a lot. We worked together a lot. Uh, no more. I love you was the second album we did together. It was a covers album. Yep. And I think she'd already started the album. I I think I've got this right. Uh, she'd started it. And Simon, her manager, asked me if I'd be interested in mixing it, that song. Yeah. And I listened to the song. So I listened to it and I thought, nah, I, I, I said to him, I can't mix this. I need to record it. I need to start again. Oh, do you? You know, it was a lot of, really, really? You don't think it's good enough? He said, no, I don't think it's very good. I think it could be really good. I kind of like the song. But I yeah. find it very, very boring and stayed. And so they said, well, see, come up with an idea. So I came up with a, an idea for how it could be done. I think this is right. Annie went, oh, great. All right, well, let's do the album. So we shipped a whole bunch of gear out to her, her house. She was uh, living in, or it was a summer, I can't remember, in Mallorca anyway, yeah. up a hill in Mallorca. So... Uh, we, we got a whole load of gear out to a room she had there and made the record there. And this is, I'm slightly confused on the timeline. I think we did it basically all there. And No More I Love Yous, uh, there's a key change in it. Yeah. Right. It, it's where it goes into a sort of instrumental pa passage. Yep. There's a key change. And I remember distinctly at that point saying to the room, the assembled crowd, which is Annie and Hef, who I work with, Hef Moraes, who's my right-hand man, engineer, saying, I'm so bored. We, we've got to do something. What we need is a yep. key change. Usual stupid remark. Oh, what we need is a key change, you know, like fix everything. And um, 
I said, I know, I'll, I'll, I know exactly what to do. And I can't, I can't remember what software I had, whatever it was. I wasn't particularly good at it. And so I grabbed all the instruments. It was all in MIDI at the time. We were just yeah. sort of getting the idea together. And I grabbed all the tracks that were music as opposed to rhythm and put in the number I thought it should be in and hit return very confidently, wound back a couple of bars, hit play, and it went to a completely different place. I don't know what I'd done. It just <laughs> went like to Mars instead of yeah. wherever I'd thought. Uh, but I listened through. I kept it going, kept it going. And at the end of the eight bars, the way it came back into the chorus made the third chorus sound amazing because it went up into the third chorus instead of down, which is what it would have done had I not messed it up. Yeah. So we kept it. To this day, I have no idea what the key change is. It doesn't really interest me. And so, so that was a really happy accident. And at which point, because it went up, I suggested to Annie, instead of starting the melody on the one, she started on the five, which she did. And, and that really opened the song out. Incredible. Anyway. So, so good. What about Walking on Broken Glass as well? Tell us more about that, that song. Uh, that was, I don't know. She had the song. I can't remember the demo. She might have demoed it with Marius, Marius de Vries, mm. maybe. And um, it was all good. Everything was good. And then Peter Vitesi. Do you know Peter Vitesi? Uh, I know the name. So uh, keyboard me. player, genius. Yeah amazing keyboard player who yeah. i worked on all three uh, and more albums any albums with with um he said why don't we do it on strings so he got a string patch up and played the piano part on strings and it sounded great uh, that that was that and then there was a a clash i remember we finished the song just about to mix it and Annie had an idea for a piano part. And it's a part in the intro that goes, do, 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 right. That part. Iconic. Iconic. Yeah. So she played it. And I said, I like it, but it clashes. What do you mean it clashes? I said, you're playing a three and the chord's playing a four. And it sounds really weird. And she said to me, well, I like it. And I said, it's not that I don't like it. It's that maybe you could change the notes around so it doesn't clash. I like them. Right. I think it sounded a bit weird. No, I like them. And I said, but it sounds wrong. What's wrong? We had this argument and she's going, what is wrong? What do you mean yeah. wrong? And I suddenly realized what is wrong? Great. <laughs> sounds fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, and I, I apologize and went, I, I'm stupid. You know, I was trying to be like, look, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought it was a clash. It is a clash, but it's a good clash. The the girl I'm working with at the moment, a Canadian artist called Posey. Okay. Uh, uh, she uh, has just sent me a, I'm working on this song and she sings a minor note over a major chord. And it sounds great. I, you know, I've sort of learned to embrace the, the whatever it is, the clash. I don't know. But it's yeah. something, you know, to begin, I was a little bit prissy about it at yeah. that point, but stupidly. Yeah. That's a really good, really good point that you've raised there, though, Stephen. So, when you've got a world famous artist that, that you're working with, and for example, they're going, okay, we should go over here with a song, and you're there going, no, I can hear this, this song in my head, how it should go. How do you, I suppose it's quite a hard question, but how, how do you try and meet them halfway? Because I know sometimes, not naming names, but I suppose sometimes you might come across someone that's incredibly talented. Many, many people are incredibly talented, but the, their ego could maybe get in the way sometimes. So how do you how, how do you handle the ego and how do you try and communicate with that artist to try and get your ideas across and also listen to My them? My ideas don't on? really matter. I'm there to serve them. Yeah. That's for sure. That, go that goes without saying. But maybe they're ideas aren't serving them as well as they think is i mean it happens doesn't it sure Not often but it can happen how how i don't know i have an argument i don't care whatever it takes you know it just depends it, yeah it, i was thinking the other day my relationship with 
people this is a bit of a weird thing to talk about and i'm loath to do it but it, it's sort of based on being flippant enough to be able to be rude without being rude yeah does that makes sense it does yeah so i can say that sounds like complete garbage and they're not offended because our sort of relationship is based on being able to say things like that fantastic That's so, so pretty good good or not i don't know it's just how how i've how i don't know how i am i suppose i find it the best a, a good way to be with people it kind of allows you to be honest yeah well, open, i remember I talking i was talking to trevor once about um i don't know who the artists we were talking to about about auto tune and he said he was saying he never tells him he uses auto tune and I said, that's funny. I always tell them I'm using auto-tune. In fact, I think it's it's great for them to know I'm using auto-tune because I yeah. think it frees them up. And he's saying, no, I don't agree. I think it's saying to them they can't sing. And anyway, so we, we whatever, we agreed to disagree on it. And um, But my thing is tell them that way that they know, oh, you know what, I can just go for it. Because if I, if I get the performance just a little bit out, we can fix it later yeah instead of i've got to get it perfectly in tune anyway my point is just being up front about these things for me just for, for my the way i am works for me amazing thanks so much that's great with um so before we have a chat about the maybe some of the other artists that you've worked with that's a really fascinating topic with auto tune i know that you know it's used now in many many pop songs as a way of you know um you know making the melody work you, you could have a, i suppose a um a singer that's not the best in the world shall we say and yet all of a sudden anybody can be a pop star if they've got the right image and the right melody but when did you notice um that auto tune was starting to become more prevalent in music was that during the 80s that auto tune started to come into play more i don't know actually i don't know the year when when was it when you tell me when did it start happening i've been very circumspect with those tuning uh plugins i'm terribly careful i never put them on auto go for it or yeah you know because often it's it's the the ache that makes things sound good you know and they don't ache when they're in tune but then that's just me for a lot of pop songs hitting a note exactly is what they need that i, I don't think i've ever done that don't think so no i'll absolutely. never i'll never put it on that auto and as it happens i don't use auto tune but but it's neither here nor there you know whatever the software i use is um it, it I, it's kind of not random i'll just listen i'll pull the thing up and go that sounds good not yeah. get it in the pocket ever that's amazing. That's so, so good. So I know that um, you've, uh, so we talk about the 80s. So you've worked with some incredible artists in the early 80s, into the mid 80s, should I say now. So maybe let's have a look at Slave to the Rhythm, Grace Jones. So I know that you were very heavily involved with that album on, with, with, with many different types of instruments. So talk to us about that project and how it came to be. Okay. Uh, Slave to the Rhythm that that's uh, a book but but in a nutshell it was a song written by simon dialer and bruce woolley and it was a up-tempo sort of not rock song but a kind of rock beat very uh, it was a high speed piece of music and um it was suggested for the frankies i can't remember that i know it was and i know holly sang it whatever anyway it didn't work and then chris blackwell thought it would be a good it was a good title for grace jones and he suggested making it a go-go rhythm oh wow and so he booked a bunch of musicians in new york yep for and bruce trevor and i were to fly to new york for five days and record this go-go band and so Bruce rewrote the song, uh, same chords, but a different rhythm. We get out there, 
hear them, realize the rhythm's completely wrong because we didn't really know what go-go was. He had a very square rhythm and this is a very swung rhythm. Yeah. And, um, but luckily managed to get some drums recorded. They couldn't play what he had. We had to rewrite the song, which we did in the hotel room and, um, then edit the drums, uh, in New York, came back, uh, then, uh, trying to encapsulate this is quite hard. Uh, sure. Trevor wasn't convinced that the loop we had was great. So the Synclavier had an upgrade. The idea was try it in the Synclavier. I tried it in the Synclavier. That was a version. Tr another upgrade or whatever. Have another go. Make it a bit more whatever. Do another version. And so that's how all the versions came out. And then while we were working on them all, things happened. Like oh, why don't we get um, uh, Jean-Paul Goud to, uh, I think it was John Sinclair, Jill's okay. brother, to read from a book Jean-Paul Goud had written. Yeah. And so he read it over a piece of music. You know, it was just stuff. We had loads of stuff, which ended up being called an album. So wow. it wasn't really an album. It wasn't like, let's make an album. It was that yeah. we had a whole load of material that was enough for an album, if you get the difference. I do, absolutely. Yeah. So how, how do you, in those moments of working with, um, I know that every project's different. So what I'm trying to say to you is the fact, how do you get into the right, maybe not the right, but how, do, do you just adapt as you go along with the mindsets when you're getting inspired with the music? Um, how do you... How, how do you know where the, where the songs are going to go, or do you just try different ideas out and try many try many different ideas? ideas? Whatever, yeah. I think I think um, I can only speak for me and the people I've worked with. But it's yeah. rare to have an end game in in your head. Yeah, you, with with a score, it's a different thing because with score, they these composers they they get melodies and then they figure they already know what the instrumentation or palette is going to be. So they know how it's going to sound and then they know how to orchestrate it. So they have a pretty good idea, but I think in, in making records, I, I think it's, I don't know anyone who knows how it's going to end up really. And, and it uh, always occurs to me that a good way not so much now because things are different, but over the years, the best way to start a project is being clueless, knowing that for me, my experience will help me if I come a cropper. But generally start with, I don't know what I'm going to do. What should we do today? You know, we'll lead you somewhere instead of going, right, today we're going to, you know, which, which is a little bit doesn't really interest me so yeah. that that's always been my ideal Incredible. <laughs> love it so so good uh tell us about working with paul mccartney on flowers in the dirt how did how did that come about and what what was your involvement involvement with paul i've worked with him before uh on a ringo album so i kind of knew him i think he knew i knew yeah he did because when i sh when we showed up he, he knew me. Uh, Trevor was asked to do it. And he said, can I, do you mind if I co-produce it with this, with me? And Paul was up for it. And we'd just come off something. I can't remember what it was. It doesn't really matter. Whatever it was, it was a long project. Yeah. And Trev had the idea of uh, two days a track. This is our thing. And there were four, I think three, he'd asked us to do four tracks on this album. And so as we were driving down, he goes, we're just two, two days. What do you think? I said, well, whatever, two days. I, so I set my rig up while he went upstairs and picked a song based on a rhythm that I programmed in a new drum box that I bought. I mean, it was yep. all a bit, which actually goes to show how hit and miss everything really is. You know, oh, you know, Paul's playing him a bunch of songs. He goes, that one, we'll do that one. And then he comes down and tells me, I picked a song because you know that rhythm you've got, that preset that you've built, yeah. Well, it work with that. Okay. You know, find the thing, play the rhythm. Paul goes, oh, great. Yeah, we'll do that. And off we go. And I ended up playing the bass. This is called Rough Ride. A song yep. called Rough Ride, which was 
in a way, the most successful of the four. I think we did four, four or five, whatever. Uh, and it was great. It was great fun. Playing the bass when Paul McCartney's in the room is a bit weird. <laughs> yeah. Just slightly weird. Especially because I was in the whole rhythm section. I had the rhythm, the drum box, and the bass. And I was in charge of the console, whatever that meant. Mm. Which I've never really known. But so mm. I was kind of running it and hitting, you know, when I hit stop, everything stopped. It was just, it was a bit strange. But anyway, it worked out well. He was delightful, as was Linda. And that, I think that song worked out really well. Did you know it? Yeah, I do. Uh, I have got an interesting question for you, though. Was it a Hofner bass that you were actually playing in front of Paul, or was it... What no, no, it was a keyboard. Oh, was keyboard. A keyboard. Oh, right, so it was yeah. a keyboard. Play. So I suppose yeah. it would have been straight, even maybe more weird to... Uh, weirder, should I say, to maybe play a Hofner bass in front of Paul yeah, that would have been <laughs> super weird. Well, in a way, I would have picked his bass up, well, it's left handed, yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> but what happened was I had this new rig I built with loads of state of the art gear. I, I, I have no idea why I did it, but at any rate, yeah. you know, loads of modules, and FM modules, and Roland modules, whatever, all stacked up in these these eight U. I think there were eight U boxes, and I had four of them. Yeah. So it was thirty four four eight four thirty two U of synths that I carted about with a computer. You know, it was ludicrous, really. And um, yeah, so I had this bass sound that came from two synths. I kind of remember them. It doesn't really matter. It was a it was a JX8P in a rack, and I can't remember what the model was. Doesn't matter. And oh. uh, a DX7 in a rack, TX802, it was called. And yeah. I had this MIDI interface. So if I played on a keyboard, it went to both. It was so exciting. You know, so I got low end from one and this twang from the other. And I thought, and, and the harder I played it, the more it twanged. And I'm thinking, oh, this is just such an exciting noise. And, and so while the rhythm's playing, and Paul picks a guitar. I, I just sort of hit the note, and he would have. I he must have said, "Oh, good, good sound," and then yeah. off I went. But what's weird? It's not so much playing; it's coming out with the part. Yeah, that that was the weirdness. You know, he that's his thing, isn't it? Unbelievably good bass parts, but yeah. in actual fact, he would be the best band member in the ever. Because he's great at everything, really good drummer, great guitarist, gr obviously a great bass player, great keyboard player, turn his hand to anything, sings brilliantly, constantly has ideas. And what more could you ask for? Yeah. It's amazing. So so really, good. yeah. Anyway, that's it. That's brilliant. So I know that um, I was watching an interview a while ago with Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. And he said that I think De uh, Paul McCartney drums uh, drummed on one of their tracks. And he's there going, wow, number one, it's Paul McCartney. And number two, Paul's playing drums. Like, <laughs> you know, and he's, you know, and obviously the guys in the band said he's a fantastic drummer. You know, he's, he's absolutely brilliant, as you say. He's brilliant. And loads of good ideas. I think on, on that song, he had the idea for playing uh, half time. So it would come out double time. Yeah. If you listen to it, he'd, he'd go, you go, to, we're working at 30 inches per second on, and how did that work? I'm a bit confused now. We must have copied to analog. I don't know how it worked, but at any rate, yeah. we recorded the drums at half speed and then wow. made them double speed. We would have been digital by then. I know we were. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Maybe whatever. But it was double speed. And he's just going, oh, yeah, I've got just run the whole thing half speed. And he did all these great fills and just instant ideas. He has instant ideas. Horns. I think he played a sax. On mm. Yeah, mad. And then you go, here, turn that bit, reverse that bit. Okay, sounded great. And then Linda. Linda was the best because she had this very plaintive voice. No mm. character, no real character, just very simple voice. 
and it suited him perfectly really amazing yeah, it was good it was great fun working with them so it sounds Apart amazing food, food dodgy why it's strict vegetarian oh, of you course know, like yeah. major vegetarian <laughs> and and i have huge respect for it and yeah. wish i was one but currently and then i'm not uh which actually cropped up with simple minds when they it was decided we were going to get manu Kache over okay yeah do you know who he is french drummer played with peter gabriel a lot absolutely brilliant yeah and um so we're doing this album there very vegetarian indeed and um he's over for a while and he kept he kept looking at me going i need meat I need meat <laughs> so i'd have to drive him down from you know somewhere in the trussocks which is a sort of middle part of of scotland down yeah. to some hotel somewhere so he could get his meat fix regularly which is a bit bizarre but anyway Oh, amazing. So tell us about working with Simple Minds and the projects that you worked on with, with those guys. Two albums, two albums, a big DVD thing and singles and stuff a lot. Yeah. Loads. L nicest guys. Loveliest guys. Uh, the second album I did with them was a bit traumatic because Mick McNeil had left oh, right. the keyboard player. Yeah. And, and um, n not that Charlie isn't uh, really good at, at coming up with ideas and songs, but mm. the thing about the keyboards was loads of lines came out. There was loads that were, came out of Mick, Mick's hands, brain, yeah. whatever, which suddenly went missing. And um, oh, well. we had to come up with an album which wasn't ideal. So we, we, uh, this is the second album I did with them. And so we went to Amsterdam, for whatever reason, I couldn't possibly tell you. Um, why does anyone ever go to Amsterdam? So oh, no. anyway, we're, yes, who knows? <laughs> so we were in Amsterdam in the basement of a studio called Visselord. It was yeah. like being in a submarine. We were there for months coming up with an album's worth of material. Is that mine? Yeah, I think it's yours. Yeah. It's right. Coming up with it. That's weird. Coming up with an album's worth of material, um, mm. which was not um, the easiest of things to do. But anyway, we did it. We did. We got an album. And loads of the album, funny enough, I thought was worked out really well. I think in between the two albums, we did this EP, which was, again, I love the EP and everyone hated it. It was a two covers and a, summing off the first street fighting years album it was um sign of the times yep and uh jerusalem oh wow my god did we get stick but i loved it we had such a good time doing it it was it was brilliant you know it was a real uh everyone had ideas all the time and i i love the way they turned out Absolutely. Um, talking about um, other bands that you've worked with. So uh, one of my favorite bands that you've worked with is uh, one that maybe some of some people that are watchers might not be aware of. Uh, Jars of Clay. Talk to us oh, about yeah. Jars of Clay, guys. Fantastic Love making band. that record. Did you hear the record? Do you know the record? <laughs> Did you know? Much Afraid, it's called. Afraid. Yeah. yeah. I do know that record, yeah. I, I think it won a Grammy. And it won another award. It was... It was an award-winning album, but it, it was uh, brilliant working with them. I loved those guys. Funnily enough, I think I was being managed by Zomba at the time. I know I was because they were on a Zomba subsidiary, a yeah. Christian label out of Nashville. And then I got this call from the management company, Jars of Clay. Do you fancy working with them? Who are they? They're a Christian band. I went, oh, Christian. Well, they'll be... They'll, they'll be respectful nice guys it, it, all rubbish yeah. going through my head but i'm just yeah. you know that's what went through my brain i went oh yeah, yeah all right i'll meet them so we did a song in london hmm. uh for a movie five candles the song was called five candles and i got my pal neil conti to play on it drummer yeah. we did the rest you know a bit of mandolin and bass and a few guitars 
keyboard between us all. We figured it, got Neil in, all good. They went back to Nashville to decide if they wanted to work with me. Yeah. For some reason, yes, we'd like to make the record with them. So we came up with a plan, and the plan was that Hef, I've mentioned Hef to you, and yeah, I yeah. would go out to Nashville. We would record the band, the tracks, the vocals, everything. We, The two of us would come back to London and fix everything up, you know, compile the vocals, pick the best guitar solo or whatever it was you had to do, you know, yeah. edit the drums if necessary, whatever, and sure. then get them over for the mix. That was our master plan, which worked really well. But in the meantime, we went to Nashville and booked this studio called Ocean Way in mm. Nashville. Yep. And oh. um, it was unusable because they'd just put this console in. It was a Sony digital console. Nobody oh, right. could operate it. So we had to find somewhere else. And I had this friend who I'd known since childhood called Chaz Sanford who incidentally wrote a song you might know with an artist called John Waite called Missing You. Huge hit. Yeah. Oh, massive. Right. Yeah. Great guy, Chaz. Mm. Uh, he had a studio up in the, I don't know, outside Nashville somewhere, like a big wooden cabin with a massive SSL, loads of gear, loads of guitars, oh. a little drum room, and that was it. And so I took the band up there. None of us had seen it. And I said, Come, what do you think? Can we work here? Yeah, figure we can work. So we de we moved up to Chaz's place, had the best time. And the drummer and bass player was a guy called Greg Wells. Yeah. Who's brilliant. Greg is completely brilliant. Yep. Best drummer, best bass player. He's just really good. Anyway, so we had the the best time doing this album. Uh, then on that album, there was a guy called Ron Huff. They got into orchestrate. I We agreed we wanted to put orchestra on a few songs. And, and they're going, well, we know this great orchestrator. And... Everyone they'd suggested had turned out really well. Like they said, oh, we know a violin player who can play on the song. What's her name? Alison Krauss. Oh, give her mm. a Brilliant, you know. So I'm up for all their suggestions. They go, Ron Huff. Okay, Ron Huff. This guy shows up. I think he had Parkinson's. Oh, wow. Uh, I suspect. Mm. Uh, I'd never seen before. Um, but he was kind of shaky. And he, he was very offhand. And he said, um, there was a, I think they call them credenzas over there. This bit behind the console with all the rack gear, right? With a big flat surface. Yeah. You know what I mean? A great big unit. Right? Yeah, yeah. He put sheet music out and he goes, right, play me the first uh, song. And so they play the song and I'm watching him scoring the song as he hears it for the first time, I'm thinking, no, this can't be happening. Doesn't That's make incredible. sense. I didn't think it. I thought it was notes. You know, he's just That's getting awesome. ideas. Anyway, uh, we get to the string session. We do it. The strings are magnificent. Mm. And uh, I, I think I, I must have asked him. I said, was, you were in the control room writing. He said, yeah, that, that's what I do. That's what I did. And if you listen, there's a song, I can't remember the song, and it doesn't matter. Beautiful, beautiful arrangement. And it if you know what he's done, you can hear him doing it. You can hear yeah. the fact that he just wrote it while he was listening. But, but somehow, he might have changed the odd note to make a chord change work. But my God, it, he was brilliant, this guy. Absolutely amazing. Came back to London, mixed it, and all good. It was really good. Great to work with them. Love them. That's an incredible story. I just I, have you ever come across anyone that's ever been like that ever again? That's been able to annotate note perfect everything down as soon as they hear it, or is that the only person that you've ever ever seen do that? No, I've never. But I'll tell you on um, an Annie Lennox song called "Why." Uh, mm -hmm. 
we we were nearly done, but it didn't sound right. And I remember saying to Peter Vitesi, uh, we're missing something here. What we need is a sort of, and I was dead vague. I said it needs an eights, a sort of eights part on a on something that sounds like a guitar, you know, oh, right. on a synth, like a keyboard guitar in eights. That would keep the thing rolling. At the moment, it's all so ploddy. And he said, you don't know him. Some of the people listening might know him, but he, he just went, ah, okay, leave it to me, you know, on his whatever it was, <laughs> JV, whatever, Roland. Yeah, so yeah, sure. Gets the sound. He goes, okay, play it, play it. And played the part from beginning to end in one yeah. take. That was the part. And it's like the main part on the song. So, so that was astonishing. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, talk to us about um, around the era in the mid-90s, so working with the late Whitney Houston as well, been the producer on uh, on her album Step by Step, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, that, that wasn't a good experience for many reasons. Um, I think she was going through a weird... She's in a weird place with weird people, and it was all weird. Everything about it was weird. We'd done the song with Annie, so yeah. the song was half done. She, it was suggested, however, for it to be in this movie. I can't remember the name of the movie. It might have been The Bodyguard. might have been the other one she did. doesn't matter. Sure. For the movie. And um, uh, she agreed to do it. Uh, so it was arranged for us to fly out. Anyway, she was, I think, two and a half, two, two weeks or three weeks, seven hours late for the session. Wow. We, you know, we get to the airport to go, and yeah. then a phone call would come. Oh no, Whitney's not ready. Make it next week. You know, and that ha kept happening. And then finally, we get there at yeah. seven at night. In, um, I can't remember where she lived. It doesn't matter. Somewhere near New York. Uh, and um, it was like a two hour drive from New York. So we fly in, go straight to her, her house. And she's not ready. She'll be, she'll be with you shortly. So we get there at seven. She doesn't show up until 12 or one in the morning, which is, so if it's one, two, three, four, six in the morning for us, they yeah. won't put the air con on because she doesn't like the air con. So we're sweltering, exhausted. She walks in, play the song, you know, with, Bobby Brown and all his pals or with shooters, you know, I mean, it was just sure. a bit weird and um, play the song, play a song. I don't like the key. Uh, and I said, well, here's the thing about the key. I've tried for two months to get hold of you to discuss the key and I haven't been able to talk to you. So I've listened to your vocal range and I figure this is the best key. I don't like the key. Let's, look, we're here. It's in this key. Let's give it a shot. The key was fine. She didn't know the song. So the whole night was spent with her not singing the song, us exhausted, Bobby wow. Brown winding everyone up. And, and so I said, well, we're going to have to come back tomorrow. Okay, come back tomorrow. By which time she kind of had a handle on the song. She never really sung it, actually. Yeah. And... Um, and then at the end, there was a whole load of stuff that went down. But at the end, she said uh, it was like seven in the morning. And we had, you know, the usual 25 million takes. And she said, uh, as she walked out, she looked at me and she goes, just do a quick comp and play it and let me hear it before you go. Seven, eight, nine. So it was, it was midday, right, for us. Yeah. Basically, hadn't slept exhausted didn't even know if we had the vocal had to put something together to play to her so we did this really quick rough comp which wasn't very good <clears throat> and uh, i i did a we did a quick rough mix and at the time it was cassette i think it was a cassette or a cd right. or whatever i think it was a cassette yeah. and uh, I, I looked at the guy there was like a guard in the room I said, uh, I'll take this over to her then, because she had the she had two houses on this New Jersey. It was on a big sort of estate in New Jersey. And the yep. studio was in one house, and she lived in another, like 100 yards down the path. And uh, he said, that's not how it's done. I said, what, what, what do you mean it's not how it's done? He goes, um, 
you give it to me, I take it to her, she'll listen when she's ready, and then she'll get back to you when she's ready. And I said, oh, that's how it's done here. That's interesting. And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, it's funny, we don't do things that way. All right. And I said to her, just take the tape off. Uh, and so he winds the tape off. I said, come on, we're off. I said, this is how we do it. So here's the fucking tape, we're out of here. And we right. just went back to London. Yeah. Never heard from her again. It was just so, everything about it was was painful. It was just painful and unnecessarily so. And then the mix turned into much the same, actually. Painful, unnecessarily Crazy. so. Really weird. So it wasn't a happy, happy thing at all. But she's a brilliant, was a brilliant singer. Uh, Backstreet Boys? Can you uh, remember much about the Backstreet Boys? And yeah, Roger? that was a nothing that was a load of nothing that that was the best thing i was as i said managed by zomba yeah who owned not owned but the backstreet boys were on jive yep and it was like they i'd done really well for the management company and it was like they're throwing me a bone they said we have a song that the guys have written and do you want to produce it? I went, uh, yes. Yeah, I'll do it. Why isn't Max Martin? He's doing his songs. He doesn't want to do their song. They want a song on the record. Sure, I'll do it. Okay. So anyway, we did this song and it was whatever, good, bad. I, I can't really remember much about doing it. So the guys were all very pleasant and can all sing. Mm. And that was all good. And everyone was happy with what we did, which wasn't that much. It was just a throwaway song on the album in a way but it there, it was a 10 song album and it sold 30 million copies wow which worked out that the one song i did on that which took a week was the equivalent of selling three million albums that's crazy yeah So that was my bone. I was quite happy with that. I'm sure you were. <laughs> I'm sure you were. For a week's work, it was good. <laughs> Amazing. So, so good. Uh, Ronan it, Keating. So, Ronan, tell us about... Yeah, I know you've done a few albums with Ronan. So it's Loads. About... I've worked with him forever. I started with them, um, again, when I was with Zomba, Stephen mm. Howard, uh, who was my go-to guy, said you should work with Boyzone because they're going to split up. And if you do a good job with Boyzone, you'll end up working with Ronan Keating. Oh, whatever. So I can't remember the song I did with Boyzone. Uh, when you say nothing at all, that was yep. Ronan, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. But there was another, Baby Can I Hold You? Was that? Yep. That was Boyzone. That was, yeah. From, from yes. my understanding, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah okay so that's what i did with boyzone uh i think maybe a few more and it, it was a big hit so i ended up it translated into ronan and it was decided that that style would be a good style for him to do a solo record so off we went to nashville to gather some songs it was quite a funny idea i think we were there for three weeks we you know all with different writers and it was semi-successful i think we got two or three uh the first week ronan saying to me i love this i'm really enjoying this no one knows who i am here you know, great whatever week two all right week three he's going i hate it here what do you hate no one knows who i am you know uh, kind of it was right. funny but at any rate <laughs> so so we did the album yeah but uh i think i can't remember what the hit was what did i say when you say nothing at all on the other one yeah uh, ba baby can i hold you yeah whichever one was was baby can i hold you ronan yeah i think so in the movie was it, whatever i think it was in the movie mm. uh bridget jones possibly oh bridget jones's diary yeah yeah I, yeah. I, th I, I might have all of this wrong. It doesn't really matter because it all ends up in the same place. Um, but apart from that, they, they were short of a single, I think. And so they got Greg Alexander to do 
life is a roller coaster oh great song yeah great yeah, yeah. so he did that on the album which kick-started the whole thing but for, we got on really well Rona and i and to this day get on really well mm. and just kept working together we've done loads of stuff loads of albums some good some not so good but but always he's such a joy to work with he's such a good guy and his singing i i've got to be honest it it's good he's really good sings really well so all in all i i'm blessed to be able to work with him so do, does he write a lot of his own stuff as well so do you, do you co-write yeah, kind of kind, yeah. kind of yeah but th that's not really the it, it suits him to write you know songs but yeah. it's not really the main thing uh no but he's good though he's really good ronan yeah, he's a phenomenal singer, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, what about uh, Jerry Hallowell? So I know that you worked with Jerry on. Uh, Ooh. on some... Ooh. Uh, was, was, was she good fun or that tells yeah. more? Yeah, she's good fun. I mean, I have, I don't know what to say. It was, <laughs> I, I worked with her because a very, very good friend of mine was ARing her and yeah. asked me to do some stuff, help on the album. I think I did, yeah. didn't do the whole album. And, um, Anyway, did whatever. And then two thirds of the way through, oh, she's been asked to do a version of It's Raining Men. That was for a movie as well. It might have been another Bridget, whatever the movie was, doesn't matter. Yeah, so something in that genre. Yeah. Yeah. So It's Raining Men. I thought, okay, figure a key, got a key. And I remember distinctly, I got two guys to work on it. Mm. one guy to do all the rhythm and one guy to do all the keyboards and while i was doing the record they were doing this all came in stuck it all together got her to sing a song which wasn't that easy mm. whatever and uh i can't remember if they're backing vocals doesn't matter whatever yeah. took no time at all and was a massive hit my friend hans he uses one virtual synth it's wow. all he uses it's called zebra that's the one thing he uses apart from all the the walls of um modular synths but zebra he and he he knows it really well and his yeah. his thing is just get to know it well you can do anything you want with it so why bother with any other synths he can make it sound however whatever is in his head he can create and it can go as complex or as simple as he wants. So that makes total sense to me. But I'm not a synthesis like him. So for me, these are dead simple. They're two synths with knobs. And I can turn the knobs and kind of get some whatever going. Yeah. But really, I, I, I don't spend that long on, on this stuff. Yeah. So, so, so what are we right in saying? It's whatever serves the song. And uh, guitar-wise, I know you're a guitarist as well. So, are there any particular guitars that you? No, enjoy I've got playing? loads as well. But I've you heard. know, I have this weird thing about sound that's probably rubbish. But I always think it doesn't matter. It it it's whatever inspires you. So maybe one day, if I'm working on a song and I think, oh, I, I, this needs a guitar, I think it needs some kind of like rockish rhythm. Mm. I'll either just go, oh, that's the nearest guitar, or I'll go, oh, I really fancy playing that. That one looks great. I love that one. So I'll play that. I never, I'm embarrassed to say, I won't go, which guitar is going to create the best sound for this? Yeah. I, I've never really gone down that road because I, I don't know. It's not the only thing in life that seems that specific is maths. You know, one and one makes two. Sure. Beyond that, I'm at a bit of a loss. I mean, what what's the right sound? I I never really know. So so I'm, I can I hear the guitar? I can hear the guitar. Well, that's the right sound. I can hear it. You know, can, yeah. is it? Am I able to play the something kind of what's in my head ish? Yes. Off we go and do it. You know, to spend hours refining the sound, I think you kind of lose the plot. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's literally a mini room. My one piece of outboard gear, can you see down there? I can. The UA, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's my one piece of outboard gear. So nice. I have a Kemper in here. Yeah. A few guitars. Most of the guitars are outside. That's um, my sort of keyboardish zone. Yeah. Right. I'm going to move around slowly. Uh, there's my headphone amp and meters, uh, some speakers, a camera, right? Uh, and, and this computer here uh, yeah. runs my monitoring and picture, which is duplicated on this screen here whenever. Ah. Uh, but as soon as I put picture on, it, it stops uh, being an image and becomes a separate screen. Uh, yeah. What else? Uh, that's it. It's my computer, little iPad. That's my room. Oh, that's amazing. Room down here. You can't see, but uh, yeah. down here I got a Trinov, a Sync HD. Uh, I've got a, I've got an MTRX sitting in a box over there, which I haven't installed yet. I've got loads. Of, can you see any of this? Yeah, I can do. I can. I know. Looking at it, I'm guessing you're a, a Pro Tools man. Looking at your uh, your yeah. rig there, is that, is that right? With um, eight, uh, two and a half inch drive bays. Yeah. Uh, SSDs. So if I go to work in my studio, I just grab a few SSDs and my iLock and I'm off. So good. I know, and everything just matches there. It's only recently I've got a Mac Pro. Um, All right. So I've been working on a laptop for years. Yeah. But, but for some, I don't know, I think it was lockdown. I was up in this room all the time, and I I thought um, I'd I'd get a Mac Pro for the room, and then when I got a Mac Pro, I thought you know what, I might as well get a um, what's it called, uh, MTRX. Yeah, yeah. So I got an MTRX, which hasn't been installed because of the virus. My guy uh, yeah. hasn't been able to come over and install it, but I think shortly we'll manage that one. Fantastic, so good. What about um I, I don't know if you're that interested with, with plugins or not, because I know that you said you're very much in the box. So I know that you've got your, your Pro Tools rig. Are you using a lot of the, the native Pro Tools uh plugins or do you use any third party plugins well, such when as you say native, Apple? you mean you mean avid? Uh yeah, the, the the avid plugins, or do you use um any third party plugins like Fab Filter or Sound well, Toys? I know this or sounds like that? a bit weird, but I I, I have God, I can't tell you how many plugins because I get projects and people have been using plugins and I tend to, I must have over a thousand plugins. Wow. It's pathetic. It's pathetic because I basically use three. Yeah. But you use, use what you like. Uh, we had a similar conversation with, uh, with uh, Tim Palmer as well. And T Tim was there very much, you know, similar idea the fact that he's got his camper that he loves as well and he gets his sound that he likes uh with with whatever guitar that he just so happens to pick up at the time and then you know just what what it is again he's got a crazy amount of plugins uh as well and he said the fact that you know i'm sure you'd agree that you, the fact you can choose any compressor known to man or any eq known to man and you can literally just bring it up straight away now you know yeah. compared to what you used to be able to do back in the day it's incredible it's remarkable, but I, you know, the in the in the box, I use the same EQ most of the time, the same compressor most of the time. Yeah. They work. They're simple. I'm fine. Too many knobs. I don't. I, I get a bit lost. There's a there's a button. There's a thing called hysteresis. Have you ever heard this yeah. word? No, I have no, 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 no. Not a clue. There, there's a a thing, a compressor or limiter called an LA3A. Yeah. It's got input and output. I love it. Absolutely love it. There's, you know, put it on, turn the knobs, it's done. It takes about five seconds to get it right. The Top Gun uh, soundtrack, how did you, you get involved uh, with, with that project? And mixing what was your... It. Mixing Just it, mixing okay. It. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I half mixed it with a, uh, a friend called Al Clay. Who, All right. Okay. We, we did it between us. We, we, we uh, talked about a plan. We got a plan of attack, and we we split the cues up and did it together. 
because it was a lot to be done in a short space of time. It was good yeah. though, really good. 